Shalom, and thanks for joining me for this special teaching. Before I get started on the teaching, I just want to take a minute to notify all of you that I will be taking a bit of a hiatus from teaching as I focus more on my conversion process. And for those of you that don't know, I've spent the last few years drawing closer to Judaism. And six months ago, I approached my rabbi about conversion. As I move closer to the day that I go before the Beit Din, I will be intensifying my studies and particularly in Jewish law or halakha. So far in short, the journey has been ever so edifying, elevating, exhilarating, and rewarding on so many levels. I look forward to with eagerness and anticipation to the day when I will be able to call myself a part of the Jewish nation, Bizarat Hashem. After which, I also look forward to continuing with the teaching series on this channel. With that said, let's get into the study. So, in addition to the recently released teaching on Parashat Mishpatim, I felt compelled to provide additional detail for several conclusions that I brought forth in the teaching. The conclusions from the teaching remain the same. However, I'd like to cover some of the source material leading to these conclusions. As a mild precaution, note that this teaching will be a bit more on the technical side as I dig into the source texts and made up of commentaries, Midrashim, and Gemara. I hope this teaching is as edifying to you as it was to me in putting it together and probing the depths of a single verse, Exodus 21.1. So let's get right into it and revisit the opening verse of Parashat Mishpatim in Exodus 21.1, but this time focusing on each of the words. So let's read it in English. I'm uh, sorry, in Hebrew first. Ve'ele ha-mishpatim asher tasim lifneham. And these are the judgments that you shall place before them. And I've highlighted the first two words in Hebrew. Ve'ele ha-mishpatim, or, and these are the judgments. So start with these first two words, ve'ele ha-mishpatim. In Rashi's commentary to this verse, we read, wherever it says these, or ele in Hebrew, in the Torah, it rejected that which has been stated previously. Wherever it says and these, or ve'ele in Hebrew, as it does here, remember it says ve'ele ha-mishpatim, not ele ha-mishpatim. It says and these judgments, not these judgments. Anyways, as it does here, it adds on to that which has been stated previously. Thus, and these, or ve'ele, of this verse implies just as that which have been stated previously. And what comes before that? The Ten Commandments. And Rashi goes further to say, which are from Sinai. In other words, the use of the Vav conjunction, the Vav is the sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And if you know a little bit of Hebrew, then you'll notice that in the verse on the previous slide, the very first letter is a Vav, Ve'ele. Anyways, in other words, the use of the Vav conjunction, which means and, denotes a continuation from the subject matter prior to this verse, and that of the giving of the Ten Commandments, as we read in the previous parasha. In this commentary, Rashi makes use of several Midrashic references. One is found in Midrash Tanchuma Mishpatim 3. And it reads, Rabbi, Rabbi Abi, Abahu said in the name of uh, Rabbi Yose ben Zimra, every place in the Torah where it states Ele, or these, 
it comes to disqualify the preceding ones. But where it states vele, meaning and these, it adds praise to the latter ones and to the preceding ones. And in this way, you can interpret all of them. Here too, when it states, and these are the judgments as we write in Exodus 21.1, it is adding praise to the preceding ones. So uh, pretty much explaining what we just spoke about. A second similar reference is found in Midrash uh, Shemot Rabbah 33. And there we read, what is written in before this package, uh, sorry, this passage, and by the passage we're speaking of Exodus 21.1, which, uh, so the verse is quoted, they shall judge the people at all times. And we find that in Exodus 18.22. And here in our verse, scripture stated, and these are the judgments. And the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 22 to 14 are stated in between these two verses, in between Exodus 18.22 and Exodus 21.1. Moving on, this sequence may be understood by means of a parable. It may be compared to an aristocratic matron who was walking along. As she walked, there was an armed escort walking on one side of her, and an armed escort on the other side of her, and she walked between the two. So it is with regard to the Torah. Judgments precede it, and judgments follow it, and the Torah itself is presented in between the two. What a beautiful way of visualizing the purpose of the Vav conjunction, the Vav, the vav meaning and conjunction at the start of Exodus 21.1, that of a second armed escort for the Torah. And the Torah is in the center, which is represented by the Ten Commandments. Why the emphasis on the Ten Commandments as the prominent aristocratic matron? Let's turn to Rashi's commentary to Exodus 24-12 for the answer. In Exodus 24-12, Hashem says to Moshe, I'll read it in English because I just realized I put the wrong Hebrew. Uh, I must have copied it from the wrong verse and put it on the slide, so apologies for that. So we'll just focus on the he English, at least the English is correct. Ascend to me to the mountain and be there, and I shall give you the tablets of stone and the Torah and the commandment that I have written to instruct them. So pay, pay close attention to the words spoken by Hashem, and I've highlighted the key ones there, tablets of stone and Torah, especially Torah. Rashi's commentary to this verse states, all 613 commandments are included in the Ten Commandments. How in the world does he come to this conclusion? The answer, the writing of the Torah was done by Moshe. And the writing of the Ten Commandments was done by Hashem. In the verse, Hashem said, the Torah and the commandment that I have written, implying that his writing of the Ten Commandments included the writing of the rest of the Torah. As such, Rashi has reasonable grounds to make the statement that all 613 commandments are included in the Ten Commandments. Furthermore, on a more elucidated level, get a little deeper here, there is a Midrash found in Midrash Midbar Rabbah 1316 that draws the same conclusion. This Midrash is for Parashat Naso, where the princes of the 12 tribes of Israel brought their offerings for the dedication of the altar of the Mishkan. The Midrash focuses on the words Lea Ketvert. The whole verse reads, Kaf Chat Hasara Zahav, Melea Ketvert. But the last two words which are highlighted in red, Melea Ketvert, which means filled with incense. And this is referring to the gold ladle of 10 shekels filled with incense. incense. And the Midrash says the following. This is to allude that the 613 commandments are included in the Ten Commandments. How? 
we'll, we'll get to that. And so, and so you find that there are 613 letters in the Ten Commandments from the opening statement, I am Hashem your God, in Exodus 22, until the final words, that belongs to your fellow, in Exodus 2014, corresponding to the 613 commandments and a seven additional letters corresponding to the days, the seven days of creation to teach you that the entire world was created only in the merits of the Torah. To pause here, what the Midrash is saying is that the Ten Commandments contain precisely 620 letters, so as to allude to the 613 commandments and there being, uh, and, and there being the very reason for the entire world that was created in seven days. Thus, the 613 commandments are included or alluded to in the Ten Commandments. Now, what does this have to do with the words Malaya Ketarit, or filled with incense? The Midrash goes on. This is what is meant by our verse filled with incense, focusing on the word Ketarit. For the letter Kuf, which is the first letter of Ketarit, may be exchanged for the letter Dalit in the al alphabetic arrangement in which the matching letters are Aleph Tav, Beit Shin, Gimei Resh, Dalit Kuf. And I would advise don't dwell on this language here too much as it's one of the methods of hidden scriptural inference uh, using a, gr a gematrical uh, letter exchange system. Final statement, the value of the word after the respective letter exchange amounts to the number 613. So what is being said here is that the 10 shekels that we read about in the verse, which refer to the 10 commandments, are filled with incense or ketret, which includes or alludes to the 613 commandments. Pretty cool, eh? So far, we have explained the importance of the opening words of Exodus 21.1 in conjunction with the Ten Commandments that precede the verse. In addition, we have provided proofs for the statement that the Ten Commandments embody the entirety of the Torah. And I, as I spoke about in the previous teaching, you can connect the dots between the 613 Commandments and the Ten Commandments. Now the question becomes, what judgments are being talked about in Exodus 21.1? Remember, it reads, And these are the judgments, focusing on the first two words. What judgments? As we briefly covered in the previous teaching, the judgments specifically refer to the 53 commandments brought forth in this week's parasha. And I apologize because I think I said 51 commandments in the previous teaching. It should be 53. Uh, and these are following the giving of the Ten Commandments. On a broad level, these 53 commandments are a series of various obligatory laws with their associated details and penalties intended for the nation of Israel in setting up a functional judicial system. And you'll have to go to through the entirety of Parashat Mishpatim to read all of the 53 uh, judgments. I'm not going to cover that here. So this brings us to the second half of Exodus 21.1. To the final words, which are written in red, Asher Tasim Lifneha, or in English, that you shall place before them. And so Rashi comments, Further on this verse, on, on this on this half of the verse, and he says, the Hakadosh Baruch Hu, that's the name of Hashem, said to Moshe, it should not occur to you to say, I shall teach them the chapter and the law two or three times until it is set in order in their mouths according to its format or until they have memorized it, but I shall not trouble myself to make them understand the reasons of the matter and its explanation. Therefore, it says, that you shall place before them like a table that is set and prepared to be eaten from its place before a person. And Orachim 
uses the same language in his commentary. I did uh, use Orachim in the previous teaching, and Orachim says they're placed before them, the, that half of the verse implies, arrange the laws before them like a set table. And the commentary of the commentary by Orachim provides additional detail, and it says there, without a deep understanding of the laws of the Torah, one cannot apply them to various situations. A superficial understanding of Torah law is likened to raw food, which is not re yet ready to be eaten. And a deep understanding of Torah law is likened to fully prepared food, ready for consumption. Moses was commanded to give the Jewish people a deep understanding of the laws of Parashat Mishpatim, just like one places only fully prepared food on his table. And we find the source for this food imagery in the Gemara, in Masechet, Ervin, uh, sorry, Masechet Ervin 54b. And we read there, Rabbi Akiva says, from where do we know that a person is obligated to repeat each lesson to his student until he knows it? As it says, and teach it to the children of Israel that we read in Deuteronomy 3 and 119. And from where do we know that he must repeat each lesson to his students until it is fluent in their mouths? It says in that very same verse, put it in their mouths. And from where do we know that a teacher must teach his students the reasons for the commandments wherever possible? As it says, Exodus 21, 1, and these are the judgments which you shall place before them. The pri and prior to these words in the Gemara, we read about the transmission system that was employed by Moshe in the wilderness. Ultimately, that the Torah was reviewed four times when it was originally taught by Moshe. And we read there, the rabbis taught in a Baraita, what procedure was followed in the teaching of the oral law? Moshe learned from the mouth of the Almighty. Aaron entered the tent of Moshe, and Moshe taught him his portion. Aaron moved aside and sat to the left of Moshe. The sons of Aaron entered, and Moshe taught them their portion. And this is the same portion taught to Aaron. The sons of Aaron moved aside. Eleazar sat to the right of Moshe, and Itamar to the left of Aaron. Next slide. That's very small. The elders entered and Moshe taught them their portion. The elders moved aside. Then all the people entered and Moshe taught them their portion. As a result, each portion was heard at this point by Aaron four times, by his sons three times, by the elders twice, and by all the people once. Then Moshe left and Aaron taught his portion to everyone present. Then Aaron left, and his sons taught their portion to everyone present. Then his sons left, and the elders taught their portion to everyone present. As a result, each portion was heard by everybody four times. From here, Rabbi Eliezer inferred that a person is obligated to repeat each lesson to his student four times. And this may be proved by a kol, a kol vachomer argument. Now, if Aaron who learned directly from the mouth of Moshe, who was the most superior teacher, because Moshe had learned from the mouth of the Almighty, had to learn in this way. That is, he had to hear each lesson four times from Moshe. Then an ordinary person who learns from the mouth of an ordinary person, how much more so is it necessary for him to hear each lesson four times? This provides a foundational basis for teaching and learning Torah. Remember the imagery of the law is arranged like a set table, spread with an array of fully prepared food ready for consumption. First and foremost, it is imperative to have a good Torah teacher, preferably an experienced, knowledgeable, and wise rabbi. It is the rabbi's job to set the table with prepared, edifying food. In learning Torah, knowing the Torah only comes through continuous study. As a child, I still remember my mother drilling me every night on my multiplication tables. Today, I know them like second nature. The same sort of discipline is required with learning the Torah. Moreover, in my opinion, 
It is not enough to just learn the Peshat or the surface level of interpretation of Torah. We need to dig as deep as possible to understand the, the every angle and the essence of the entirety of the Torah. It is so deep. So let's reiterate Exodus 21 one, one more time. And in English, these are and sorry, and these are the judgments that you shall place before them. The judgments of Parashat Mishpatim are derived from what comes before this verse. The Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments represent the entirety of the Torah. These judgments, and hence the entirety of the Torah, are set before us like a table full of prepared food, prepared for us by those learned learned and experienced in the Torah. It is then up to us to eat, to consume the prepared food, to absorb the flavor, the substance, the nutrients, and ultimately the essence, the depth of the Torah into our beings for the purpose of empowering us to transform our lives in this world to fully serve and obey the giver of the Torah, our Heavenly Father, Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. May we take the words of this verse to heart as we move forward through the remaining parashot of the Torah that contain the bulk of commandments, of the 613 commandments found in the Torah. Learning, analyzing, and probing them over and over and over again, all the while applying them to our lives in our service of Hashem. Sure.